Look, I'm, um, I, I'm just wondering what I can add um, to what's been said. Um, I, uh, I, I assume you may know, I, I chair the um, Independent Commission on Fees. So I've, um, and over the next two and a half years, we're going to spend quite a lot of time just seeing to what extent um, the fees fee increases uh, have kind of changed the character of admissions and acceptances uh, to uh, English universities. I'll say a few words about that. But I mean, just to put my own cards on the table, um, you know, I've only had, um, from, I've just recently traded being a kind of journalist uh, commentator to actually being a kind of small time actor in higher education um, as a principal of an Oxford college, which is a kind of interesting experience. Um, and uh, I mean, here are just some, some uh, the framework in which I think about this issue. First of all, um, uh, I do think that, um, and something that's very important to me personally, um, I do I think that the, uh, the, the university at its best uh, encompasses um, the best of um, the European Enlightenment. And I think some of, uh, indeed I would argue that all of um, this room's reaction um, to what's happening to universities um, is actually because I think that Enlightenment tradition um, in Britain, Europe, and America uh, is under immense pressure and has been under immense pressure um, for a generation. Uh, we sometimes think of that as a kind of economic liberalism or market fundamentalism. Uh, I'm, um, I'm much more forgiving about markets, perhaps, than either of the two speakers. Uh, a much more, and my, I wrote a book, my very first book, it's called The Revolution That, that, that Never Was, uh, which I published in 1986, in which I try to say that people like me who passionately believe in Keynes um, should not regress to a kind of bastard Keynesianism in which any attempt to have budget constraint was seen as, you know, uh, against the Keynesian tradition. Um, what I can tell you, as a, as a man who's read um, most of Keynes's work, that actually, you know, he wouldn't simply be an anti-Austerian in 2013. Um, his critique of capitalism was much more sophisticated than that. Um, if you think you can uh, just make that actually the, the, the locus of the argument, I'm not sure we're going to win it. Um, but I think something more serious is going on, this retreat from the Enlightenment. I see it in the debates over climate change. Um, I see it over the... Uh, Worryingly, I think that um, the kind of, uh, I think the emergent um, retreat of the best advances of feminism. Um, I see it in the debates over um, immigration, uh, over um, the way we talk about multiculturalism, which I think is, com you know, completely <laughs> hopeless. Um, I see it actually also in a, in a, in actually uh, r the way in which. Uh, uh, the popular press have interpreted uh, things like, you know, the, the menace of the MMR vaccine. I mean, across the piece, you see a, re a, re a retreat from Enlightenment values, from an idea of um, the public realm, what you described as the commons. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's more, what's taking place, I think, is uh, more subtle and... Uh, and more profound, I think, than can be captured by inveighing against markets and economic liberalism. Um, and so that's, and I think what's happening to universities is that it's consequently, um, kind of, if we're going to capture it and um, defend them, we better have an idea of what we think they should be, um, rather than kind of negatively saying that what we dislike. And I think getting a good answer to that is very hard when actually as a national community, this country doesn't have you know, much idea about what it really wants to be in 25 or 30 years' time. It's profoundly contested. Um, so I'm not, just to say, uh, I do think uh, uh, that in a world in which um, the chief economist of the IMF, Olivier Blanchard, um, uh, um, has uh, argues um, against, actually, the Washington Consensus and uh, market fundamentalism. Um, and very few economists in the Faculty of, e of Economics would now argue um, for uh, general equilibrium theory 
or the axioms of simple economic rationality. Um, you probably couldn't get a job in the Bank of England if you were to ever argue this stuff. So we've got to be careful. I mean, someone like uh, Andrew Haldane uh, or um, the people on the MPC don't buy it for a minute. Um, you couldn't justify quantitative easing um, if you did that. And not even George Osborne with his um, Lend to Buy program that he's just rolled out, or actually the magnificent kind of uh, uh, essay he's written um, in front of the £2 billion uh, seven-year um, industrial policy for aerospace, which actually could have been penned by Tony Benn in the early 70s. You know, this is not, this is a much more complicated environment which we're navigating. And, it, and I, I don't think it helps us to just kind of say, you know, the bastards are economic liberals and market fundamentalists that are out to get us because, you know, it's swirling around and, uh, and actually, I think, trying to capture what the, what, what the threats are uh, and what the best response to is actually quite complex. Um, I do think, um, if you think the university at its best embodies enlightenment ideas, what are they? Well, I mean, I'll set out three or four principles that you know, I think um, are just... You know, we have to fight to our last to preserve and then just try and see if you think those are the principles to what extent what's going on threatens them or paradoxically uh, maybe actually kind of helping them. I mean, one for me is autonomy. I mean I do think the university, the enlightenment idea of the university and indeed actually the pre-enlightenment idea of the university was one that was, it was autonomous from preceding the enlightenment from church and, and crown and uh, more obviously, kind of, uh, uh, at the Enlightenment, that was kind of entrenched. Uh, constitutional autonomies uh, were the way you protected academic freedom, um, the freedom to research, the dare to dare to think, um, to publish and to exchange ideas. Uh, uh, autonomy seems to me to be, uh, uh, um, when you talked about um, them being kind of marketized corporations, you know, there's a narrow, there's a, you know, a public autonomous organization uh, could be described in those terms. So, you know, if, uh, and actually one of the paradoxes of the fee regime, um, and I'm a critic of the fee regime, one of the paradox of the fee regime is actually um, two things. One, it's actually uh, helped autonomy rather than hindered it. No one wants to acknowledge that. Secondly, uh, it's, um, uh, if, you're in the, if you're a treasury official, there is increasing alarm about this backdoor way of actually introducing what de facto may prove to be largely free edu higher education. Why? Because these £9,000 fees, and they, all the calculations were done on 70% of the fees being repaid. Now they reckon the figure could be as low as 40%. And actually, uh, and a growing number of applicants to universities are kind of, the pen is dropping, this is a, a much better way with all the bursaries and reliefs for if you come from um, disadvantaged households. Actually, uh, the fees have turned out to be um, a kind of massive miscalculation by the Department of Education, the Department of Biz. Um, uh, and there is going to be a problem 15, 20 years' time when £30 billion pounds worth of accumulated fees are, and the loans associated with to pay for those fees are simply not going to be serviced. Um, so I think that, you know, then, you, then speaking as someone who's looking at the impact of those fees, you can see that the applications are down by 12%, um, but actually uh, offers are down much less and acceptances hardly down at all. Then you have to disaggregate and you find that actually there's some very worrying trends underneath that, that actually um, boys um, from disadvantaged homes where neither parent has gone to university their, applica their, their applications and their acceptances are down alarmingly, as are um, uh, people who want to study part-time, as are, as are uh, anybody over 20. So within this, uh, there's uh, some really alarming subtrends. But, you know, we've got to make our attack on this much more forensic than just say, this is marketization. Um, then I think there's this notion of you know something that I, I feel passionately about and where I do, where I am really where I I think that as um, uh, I think that one should actually you know really man the barricades is if you believe that actually universities are um, if you believe in the in the in the sanctity um, of academic freedom and the importance of um, research and actually the connectedness of actually a research institution being a teaching institution. You know, I observe from really worrying trends. 
I mean, I think that um, as the state retreats from the provision of public monies for research, you actually see research priorities dictated by uh, actually um, corporations. And you see uh, all kinds of things being pulled out of joint. You can actually see I mean, a university like kind of Oxford becomes, you know, what happens is, is that because the donors want to give money in a certain way, that actually you get XYZ Institute constructed or ABC unnecessary building constructed uh, or uh, um, one, two, three um, research program because it's actually kind of the priority of the, of, the, of the donor becomes actually what people kind of have to do because that's the only place the money is. And here I think there's a second characteristic of the university. It is a public institution. And actually... Um, here, I think that um, the kind of the 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 the, um, the attack on publicness of this institution by actually you know undermining um, um, you know, under undermining the universality uh, and the um, kind of impartiality, if you like, of um, where uh, an academic in whatever discipline kind of needs to take their thinking. Um, is for me a really profound threat. And then there's a th third aspect, I think, of the university, which I think uh, really worries me. And, we're, and at this moment in time, I think, is actually, if you believe in this enlightenment conception of the university, uh, is being, is again, just being kind of ignorantly uh, devalued. And there's actually a university stands and falls uh, in all its disciplines, actually. Um, um, having um, parity of esteem and parity of value. Um, I don't like to see um, kind of STEM subjects being privileged over um, humanities. Um, uh, I think that it's, I think that you, you lose the, I mean, the whole point of the, of the serendipities uh, between the disciplines and, the, and where all, I think, the advances intellectually and academically are going to come in the future. Uh, kind of uh, lie in kind of the interdisciplinarity and, and jumps and crossovers. That actually, if you if if somebody says, well, we think we think as your funder that actually you shouldn't actually be investing in the humanities or actually in the social sciences particularly. You know, where you should take it is only in the things which actually have you know um, commercial ap um, applicability you kind of lose the very idea of the university, which could actually be a trigger to a kind of knowledge-based revolution. So I kind of, I'm really, I, 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 I really um, find that um, trend um, in government thinking and, the, and in the public discourse really very kind of worrying. I'm also um, um, a sponsor in Oxford of the open science movement, and I founded a, a think tank called the Big Innovation Center that's committed to open innovation. And actually, um, the more I've gone on with this, um, the more I've been I've, I've, um, learning partly by doing and partly by um, kind of reviewing the evidence that actually you know, the best advance in innovation and science are ones in which actually you don't um, uh, kind of immediately copyright or patent everything that moves. I think I can make a pretty good argument that one reason why kind of productivity growth and the pace of innovation in the States has actually slowed down in the last 15 years is because of the growth of the kind of painting and copywriting and all the gaming that goes on between the great law firms and every and the desire of so many universities and states to kind of do that as almost the first thing they do actually inhibits um, uh, in, inhibits scientific advance uh, you know so I, if you and that's another thing which I which I think one has to be um, absolutely rigorous in defense about Willits is ambiguous on these questions. You know, sometimes Willits, I think, gets it wrong. But on this open science, open innovation stuff, you can, at least the British government is actually uh, almost alone of OECD governments taking a much more liberal position on painting and copywriting um, than, um, than other governments, even, even as it tries to make you know, universities actually turn themselves into businesses. So it's kind of, you know, again, we have to be forensic about um, what's going on. And lastly, I do think on this question of access. I mean, I'm, I'm and I do find that. Um, I mean, there are there are about there are forty two thousand um, eighteen year olds who get three A levels um, 
at a, a grade or a start. Um, and 17,000 of those 42,000 are educated in private schools. And I think it's, you know, those 42,000, one way or another, are going to find themselves into the Russell Group. And actually, you know, beating the Russell Group up and actually beating Oxford and Cambridge up over the fact that um, a third of all the candidates who have necessary qualifications to go to, you know, to go to Russell Group University actually are educated in independent schools. Um, you know, um, don't get at the um, bigger story about actually how we've put our education system to be so kind of massively um, unfair. And you have this, you know, you know the, the, the university sector sits at the top of the heap. Of, uh, you know, there are 800,000 um, kids born, you know, every year. Um, and we have constructed a system in which actually we look after 100,000 of them but not the other 700,000. And I, I, and I think that um, you know, when we think about defending higher education, I think we have to have an idea of how, that, of how higher education sits in an education system that would genuinely kind of, um, do something um, for the, you know, mass of, um, the mass of our people, which it certainly doesn't at the minute. Um, I, I get, I have, I'm, I'm probably um, more radical on, perhaps, I shouldn't say that, actually. I imagine there's some people here who make common cause, but I do think that the um, the scale and size of the independent sector in Britain education is the kind of is the elephant in the room that we don't talk about enough. So, I mean, I end up by saying um, I think that I, mean, I, I do think whether it's a discussion I'm going to write this weekend in the Observer about the boasting about the fall away in these net immigration figures as if that's a wonderful thing that um, so and driven almost entirely the 90,000 fall. Um, 2012 on 2011 by the fall away in, a, in students um, coming into the country as if that's a great triumph. Um, and I do think that um, you know, we've permitted a kind of national conversation to take place in which actually you know, it's kind of, and people think oh, it's brilliantly brave to say the alleged unsayable uh, and the alleged unsayable is that uh, how immigration has been too high for too long and, and Students and universities have been part and parcel to the gaming of the system. So, kind of honest to God, striving um, working class people had their wages undermined and their classrooms um, stuffed up with um, um, immigrants from abroad who haven't paid their due desserts and paying their. Everyone knows the story. Uh, and I, you know, how to contest that? How to contest that? How to win an argument on that? And I think that. Um, I'm coming around to the view that actually, I'm just, just finish off on this, and I think, it's, I think the, the, the same things are true And when we discuss universities and higher education, how to win this argument. I do think we need a, one needs a, and we need um, you know, a really inspiring idea of what um, our country should look like in 25 years' time. And, you know, and from that inspiring idea of what the country should look like in 25 years' time, which for me would include you know, a celebration of public institutions. Uh, for me, would celebrate openness. For me, would celebrate, um, um, although I share your view about crude things about social mobility, it would, it would be something about enfranchising everybody genuinely. Um, and I think part of the story would be um, the kinds of company and, and the kinds of way our elite would behave and the way this country would, would relate to Europe and the world. You know, but if you don't have that conversation and don't locate an argument about universities within it, I think we're always going to have our backs against the wall, rather. Um, and, and, we, and we talk to ourselves rather than talk to the public beyond. Um, but I'm, thank you very much. That's, my remarks have come to a close. Thank you. <laughs>